Hi, Dad. I hope this is okay. I'm standing up now. Hello, you plonkers, and welcome back today to another video on the True Footy channel. Football is back, baby. Druzy is back talking about football from the other side of the planet. Man's living in England now, and I'm doing nine things we learned on the True Footy channel instead of the Druzy channel. Basically, I've done this because I really want to help Jesse out this year with the True Footy channel, as well as me traveling Europe. I'm not going to be able to make videos every single week because, you know, I'm in and out of the continent, living my life over here. But I still want to keep the footy content going because I absolutely love it. I hope you guys enjoyed nine things we learned last year enough to hop back on board this year because I loved making it for you guys. So we're going to get into the nine things we learned from AFL round one. Footy's back, baby. Let's go. Before we get into the video, I just want to say if you've ever watched a True Footy or Druzy YouTube video, this year is the year to really get around Jesse. He's going all in on the channel. He's trying to follow his passions and his dreams. So if you watch True Footy consistently, just leave a like, literally comment, just that small stuff. Follow him up on Instagram and let's help Jesse make his dream a reality. Are you a True Footy fan? If you are, support the channel as much as you can this season. We both appreciate it very much. Now let's get on with the nine things that we learned from AFL Round 1 2023, baby. Number one. Colton's lack of game management cost them points again. There's no denying the quality and the potential of this Colton side. I'm not taking a massive shot at Colton here, but again, late in games, their players not having the right mentality to finish the game and win the game has cost them points dearly. Last year, we saw them bottle games against Melbourne and Collingwood, which eventually cost them a spot in the top eight just by lack of game management in the final dying moments in the fourth quarter. On Friday night, it was the same story. Lockie O'Brien running down the wing has Harry Mackay in acres of space. All he has to do is put it out in front of him, get his head up, and hit the man up, or at least kick it towards the boundary to get a stoppage so the Blue Boys can set up behind the ball and stop Richmond pinging it to the other end. Instead, he doesn't lift his head up. He allows time for the Richmond defenders to get back into position, and then the ball just comes straight out. He stretched the field so much forward that the space is there for Richmond to run into. A great mark from Tom Lynch and a clutch goal to tie up the game to make the first game of 2023 a draw. Again, I'm not taking a massive shot at your entire football club, Carlton fans. What I'm saying is, if you want to be a top side, which you do have the potential to be, game management has to be better late in games. Number two, Collingwood have more gears than the Cats. Last year in finals, this game was an absolute cracker and it lived up to a similar standard again in round one. We know what to expect from Geelong. They're absolutely class. They're as mature as any side in the competition. They're the premiers for God's sake. But the point I'm trying to make is you just always know what you're going to get from Geelong. But when they thought they had the game won in the third quarter or maybe they took their foot off the gas a little bit, Collingwood said, all right, lads, you want to go for a run? Let's see how many gears you can go. Bang. Eight goals in a row from just about five minutes left in the third quarter to storm home, take the momentum, and get the four points. When Collingwood get momentum in games, it is extremely difficult to take it back off of them, especially when you got that MCG crowd behind them. I really liked what I saw from Bobby Hill in this game. I think he's a player that is made for moments like these. Getting three goals on his Collingwood debut was immense. And I also like Tom Mitchell's game as well. Kicked a really tough goal in that eight-goal run. Um, and yeah, the Collingwood fans seem to really love him. The group is really together. Flag Pies, they are back. They are looking very, very good. And Nick Dacos, what a player he is. What a player he continues to be. It's a pleasure to watch players like this as they come through the AFL. Genuine generational talent. Number three. She's Louise. <laughs> Harry Sheasel racked up the most disposals of any first game player since 1991. This kid could be big. He's come into the competition looking like a ready-made AFL player. He's not like frail, he's stocky, he's clearly put in the work and has the skill on the ball. He played in defense against the Eagles, which sort of reminded me of how Nick Dacos started his AFL career last year. Start in the back, get plenty of disposals, and show your class on the ball. That's exactly what Harry Sheasel did against the Eagles. He's proven in the lead-up to the draft that he can play as a midfielder or a forward or a mid-forward hybrid of both. So going back down uh, to defense and playing as a backman in his first game at the AFL level just speaks to his versatility as a player. Obviously coached by Alistair Clarkson as well. So this kid could learn very fast at the top level. 
Overall, the Roos looked inspired and got out to a big lead against West Coast, and credit to West Coast for fighting back, but I reckon the Roos will be alright this year. I reckon they'll climb out of the bottom sort of 3-4 uh, and get some wins. Some really good performances across the park, guys like Curtis Taylor, Nick Larkey, both having very good games also. Number four, Port's new look midfield launches them back into finals contention. The talent that Port Adelaide have is clear for everyone to see. It's always been there. It's just a matter of can Ken Hinckley get the best out of this side. He couldn't in 2022, but boy have they bounced back in 2023 with a massive statement win against the Brisbane Lions. Jason Horn francis Zach Butters and Connor Rosie in the midfield is absolutely elite. What a great young mix of players they have in there, led by Travis Boak, an absolute legend of the club, and a Brownlow medalist in Ollie Wines. This midfield could be real dangerous in 2023. And I think the most dangerous part of this midfield, unlike Frio's, you know I'm a Frio fan, I like to talk about Frio and compare, is that each midfielder brings something different. Horn Francis is that explosive, strong, danger field type player. Then you've got Zach Butters, who I probably put in the same vein as a Sam Walsh. Runs all day, relentless worker, just an absolute workhorse. And then Connor Rose, the silk, the skill, and the class, obviously led by the two veterans I mentioned earlier as well. And this win provides a lot of optimism for Port Adelaide fans. In a year where it could, go, could have gone one of two ways, Maybe the players stop playing for Ken Hinckley and want some new life in the, in the club, I suppose, want to play a different style of football, but it hasn't gone that way. They've completely bought in. The new faces in Horn Francis and Willie Rioli have added a lot to this side, and Port Adelaide could bounce back up to where they were in previous years to 2022. If you've been watching the True Footy channel recently, you will have known that me and Jesse are now collaborating on my business, which is Drewsy's Athlete Academy. In April, I'm running a 30 days of fitness challenge. Now, this may seem daunting, but I did it when I was 19. I was 49 kilos, just come out of high school. I was anorexic and genuinely depressed. I wanted to make exercise a habit, and just by doing it that 30 days in a row, it just embedded it into my routine. I'm doing it for a small cost, I think, of $15, which is the same price as a Big Mac meal. A Big Mac meal will make you fat and sad. <laughs> a Big Mac meal is terrible for your health. Exercise, on the other hand, for 30 days is going to do a lot to your physical and mental health. I'm not just going to take your money and run. I'm going to coach you every single step of the way. If you want to make exercise a habit, 30 days of fitness will get you there to where you want to be. DM me at underscore Druzy or at Druzy.AthleteAcademy on Instagram for more information or head to the website using the link in the description for more. Let's get on with the rest of the things. Number five. Opposing fates from the 2021 Grand Final. The trajectory and the fates of these two sides since the 2021 Grand Final is completely different. The Ds, barring a poor final series last year, have continued to improve from that 2021 Grand Final. They've obviously added Brody Grundy into the side, who, in tandem with Max Gorn, dominated the hitouts on the weekend against the Bulldogs. English and Lobb didn't stand a chance against two of the elite Ruckmen of this generation. And the Bulldogs lost their best and fairest winner in Josh Dunkley. They haven't really strengthened, in my opinion, except for adding Rory Lobb, but he's not going to be the answer to the Bulldogs' questions. And for me, the same problems as last year remains. They're poor defensively, and they fade out late in game. The D's were comfortable winners at the MCJ on Saturday night. I think the D's looked great. They looked back to their best, playing a good brand of footy, which they are confident in that they can deliver, as they did in 2021. And on the other side of the coin, I just don't think this year is going to be a good year for the Bulldogs. I think they'll grind out results here and there, but I just don't think they're it. I think they're a long way off it still. And it's just interesting to see how two sides who were so close in 2021 can be so different just two seasons later. Number six. Bloods pick up where they left off. Sun's still underwhelming. Any signs of a fracture from the Premiership loss were thrown out the window as Sydney smashed the Suns on Saturday night. Not going to lie, did not watch Sydney vs Gold Coast. I was eating schnitzels and drinking steins in Germany. But you look at the stat sheets and it's just the same old story for Sydney. Chad Warner dominating with another 30 disposals. Buddy, McDonald and Papley contributing to six goals between them and keeping the opponent to a low score. Great performance from the Swans. From the Suns' point of view, it's just the same old story. Still not quite good enough to compete with the top sides. And this project, it's just going to take a while, isn't it? They're still a young, developing side. I know they have been for their entire existence, but I don't think you can really expect too much 
uh, from a Gold Coast point of view. Maybe be a bit more competitive earlier on in the game to give yourself a chance at winning. But the Swans, their quality, we know how good they are. Other than the grand final blip last year, they had a very, very good 2022. um, And that puts a statement on the map again that they want the premiership again. And they're going to be there or thereabouts. Number seven, GWS Giants comeback win puts the league on notice. Toby Green said this was the hardest win or game he's ever played in. 36 degrees and humid. There were players cramping up in the second quarter. Not good conditions for one of the most brutally and physically demanding sports in the world. I don't think we really recognize how brutal of a sport Australian football is. Running around for two hours, tackling all that malarkey. I'm not talking about the game here, but to play in 36 degrees heat at this level, it is... Literally like you are dying, I could imagine. I could only imagine. Toby Green, Cornelio and Maud all had really good games. And Tom Green, the young star, he's genuinely going to be an All-Australian, potential Brownlow medal winning player one day. The kid is a bull. So good at such a young age. He had a massive game with 37 touches. Aaron Cadman kicked six goals in the VFL as well. So he could slot back into this side um, and make a big difference next week, potentially. And you've still got guys like Finn Callahan who got picked up in last year's draft. There's so much talent coming through at GWS, so it's only a matter of time before it clicks and they start to get wins. Let's not forget, two years ago, they were a top eight side. They could potentially bounce back in there in 2023 under new coaching. We'll see how the Giants go in 2023, but it was a great start to the year for the Giants. Number eight, the Bombers can smile again. After a shitty 2022 season, the Bombers bounce back with a big win at the MCG against Hawthorne. Tip is back, a big win. Alwyn Davy Jr. kicking a goal, a father-son. You can just smile. You're like, yes, football isn't as shit as I thought it was. I reckon they've got a new lease of life under Brad Scott. Maybe he's not the man to bring Essendon a premiership. Maybe he is. But I think what he brings is just stability, structure, and a proven track record that he can improve the trajectory of an AFL club. So, I mean, you haven't been able to say that about the past coaches at Essendon. I think he's going to do a good job there. This Essendon side does have some experience as well. I know they haven't been great over the last few years, but they have like 100 game plus players throughout this list, which you can't say for Hawthorne. Um, and that makes me worry about the Hawks and how this season is going to go for them. Essendon, though, we're focusing on the Bombers today. All their fans are going to have a smile on their dial as they get back into the W column. They've got Gold Coast next week. They're going to go into that game with a lot of confidence. 2-0 in the season potentially coming up for Essendon, which will give the club a lot of optimism. And number nine, same problems for Frio need to be fixed now. Watching this game was very frustrating as a Dockers fan. Credit to St. Kilda, let's just say that first. I'm putting down the phone and I'm just going to have a nice little moan about Frio here. Like, I don't want to hop on the club and be like, you suck, why are we still shit? Why is Matt Tavern still in the side? But at the same time, there's still problems that haven't been addressed. The forward mix doesn't work. Nat Fife, elite midfielder a few years ago. Brownlow medal winning midfielder. One of the best players of the generation. But as a forward, it just doesn't work. You can't just slide him into this side and expect him to work as a forward when all of his best work as a footballer has been done in the midfield. So that frustrates me. And Matt Tavener, I'm not going to bash on the man because he gets enough criticism as it is. But he, he just isn't good enough. He's just not up to the level to be our key forward. We've seen it time and 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 time again. This forward mix doesn't work. The smalls, they do the work. Switkowski, Schultz, Frederick. These guys are genuinely going to be in the side that takes us forward. Matt Tabner is not. Nat Fife is not going to be in our forward line if we are to win a premiership. And we just looked lost, to be honest. Like, I don't think it looked like we were communicating too well out on the ground. When goals were going in, our heads were dropping. Free were playing quite a high line, and I've been watching quite a lot of soccer. I call it football now because I live in England. But there's no offside rule in Australian rules football. And what seemed to happen every single time the Saints scored was they were just bombing over the top to a fella in a non-offside position, if you're catching my drift. They were just getting it over the back every time and running into an open goal. What the flipping heck is going on? We're one game into the season. I don't want to bash on us too much because we started slow last year and then went on a big winning run. But Jai Amos has to play in this side as a forward. He's our best option, most dynamic player we have in the forward line. 
And I think you need that flair from guys like O'Driscoll as well. Guys with X Factor that can change games around on their head just in moments. So it was the most Ross Lyon game ever as well. 67 to 52 or something like that. Low scoring game. Boring football. Look forward to that St. Kilda fans. God, he just sucks the life out of everything, that bloke. But fair play to the Saints. Four points. Congratulations. And that's going to wrap up nine things we learned. But before you click off the video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the True Footy channel if you're new. There's going to be so much content on this channel this year. So make sure you get around Jesse. Support the man. Support the Drews. Drewsy's Athlete Academy. If you need help with your fitness, let a man know and I can coach you through every step of the way. Thanks for watching the video. We'll see you on the next one. Take care, you plonkers.